Jeremiah chapter 22. As we do look around in the world today, in our country, and not just in our country, but in other countries too, we do see a a trend going on. Uh, It just seems like uh, the enemy is is really taking a hold of this terrorist group, uh, the Muslims, uh, Islam, and they are just... uh, destroying anything that, that's that's basic as far as um, compassion and love and and freedom and then just trying to dominate this whole world in a sense and, and we know that that's part of what's coming in the last days this this great evilness that will take place is hatred and then you just look at uh, humanity itself and what's going on in the world today with uh, the youth and this coldness uh, that people just have uh, towards one another, this lack of trust, this lack of commitment um, that's just taking place. It just seems to be a coldness. I don't know if you notice it. I notice it in the world. It's almost like people are in their own bubble now, and, and you can't enter in that bubble. It's because there is where they exist, and they don't want anyone getting too close and so forth. And so there's a coldness. And the Bible talks about that coldness in the last days, that, that love will wax cold we won't really have the love that God has given unto us. Uh, a lot going on in, in the world today. The church itself and, and the lack of its witness itself. What do people read when they see you live your life? What do they read? Be honest with yourself as I ask you that question. No, don't, don't shout it out. But be honest with yourself. How do you live and what do people really see in you? What have people said about you? about your life, about your attitude. You look at the church today and and you see a a lack of leadership within the church. There are a few committed men and and quite a few committed men that love the Lord and are great examples uh, within the Calvary Chapel, within the Assemblies of God and non-denominational churches. But there are also quite a few that are not great examples that are out there. Uh, Even within the Calvary Chapel, we had a, a very popular pastor uh, of a huge huge church in in florida who had just fallen away uh, fell into sin when people see you what do they read they can often read good things but in reality what's behind the scenes can be devastating if they knew what was going on and ultimately god sometimes brings that up to the front to let the world know that that uh, men are sinners and we fall short of the glory of God. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians that the people there who were part of the church realized that their existence within the kingdom of God and the ministries that they held were a part of Paul's ministry. And so they contributed it to Paul's evangelistic outreaches to Corinth there. And so Paul, in a sense, was using them as a recommendation uh, of his apostleship, of his authority. In 2 Corinthians 3, 1, he said, uh, Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendations from you? In other words, he was saying, look... uh, we were here before and we shared with you the gospel and many of you were saved. Now we come again. Do we need a letter from someone? Like others have letters that give them authority. Uh, do we need something signed with a seal on it? You know, is, is that what you're expecting from us as you do from others? And then he goes on in verse 2. You are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Paul said of the church that You are our epistles. We had a part of God's work in your life. And if we need some recommendation, then you are it. Because men are reading you and they're reading your life changed. And so for us, that is recommendation enough. Now, the part that I want to focus on is how all men read you. Men read us. They watch us, the people that, that God has put us in the midst. You know, I'm there in my little community there in, in here in Mariloma in Sky Country area, and I, I live in the home there, and there's uh, families all around me, and, you know, we're, we're out 
in the front yard. We're in the backyard, and uh, we have, uh, you know, parties come over and, and enjoy uh, the fellowship and so forth, and, and they're watching us. They're watching us. They're, they're watching how we act. They're, they watch what we do. They, they watch what's in our trash can. You know, I'm so scared to even put things in my trash can. That's why if you come over to my house, uh, you don't drink. You don't smoke. I don't allow that stuff in my house. I got rid of that years ago, over 20-something years ago, and I just don't allow that. I was, I was so scared in the beginning that, that even these uh, cedar uh, apple cider bottles, you know, that look like champagne that you pull out on Thanksgiving or the holidays or a special occasion. I was so uh, scared that if we threw those out in the trash can that they'd look and say, oh, look, look, they do drink. You know, because from a distance, they almost look like champagne bottles. And so I'd make sure that we get those bottles and put them in the, in the, in the, in the container and hide them really good and throw them deep down in there. Because I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to stumble anybody. Because I understand that men read us. You know, when you're on the freeway, when you're at work, you know, how do you respond to certain conditions, you know? And what do people think of you as they watch you and so forth? That should concern us, shouldn't it? Because it's our witness. Uh, we're not to be lights. We are lights. We are lights because Christ dwells within us. Uh, we are salt. And so people taste us, uh, whether we taste sour, or whether, we, whether we taste sweet and so forth. We should be praying that the Lord would use us as, as great lights with compassion and, and, and sweet tasting aromas in a sense to all men so that they would come to know Jesus Christ. That should be our heart and that should be our passion. That should be our prayer in our daily living to be an example. Uh, we are the evidence of God's saving power, are we not? We are the evidence at times. At, at our men's breakfast, we talked a, a little bit about uh, humanism and then got into um, uh, some of the thoughts of atheism as Richard was explaining it and so forth. And he was, he was sharing with us how we have to give evidence of our faith. We have to defend our faith. And, and how we defend our faith is by the evidence that is clear to us. Now, it's, it's just not a matter of, I believe and I have faith in this, and so you should believe and have faith in it too. That's not enough. That's not enough for people. They want to know why they should believe in this. They want to understand it. They want to know the evidence that's behind it. Now, yes, I think that our changed life is a part of that. But I think that beyond that, you should have some historical backgrounds to the scriptures, through to the men, uh, the Jews, uh, to Jesus, to the disciples, and so forth. Uh, how do we know they existed? Just like we know Abraham Lincoln existed. Anybody see Abraham Lincoln? Ever see Abraham Lincoln? No one of us ever seen Abraham Lincoln. You know, he didn't exist, you know, now. He existed way back in the 1700s. And so, uh, you know, we don't know that he existed. The only way that we know he existed was through historical documents, that have been written down, and that's the evidence that he exists. So we know he existed. We know that he was a president because of these documents. Well, we have the same amount of documents for Jesus Christ. And so that should be enough evidence for us to believe that there's a Jesus Christ. So the historical evidence, and we, we heard about the prophetic evidence. There's enough prophecies just in the coming of Christ that, that would just tell us, well, the odds of this happening are impossible, and yet it happened. So that's pretty amazing. So that's some evidence there. You know, and then you have the archaeological evidence. You know, they, they, they have found a, a plaque that says Pontius Pilate governor. And for years, uh, there was no evidence that there was a governor. And so they said, see the Bible, you can't trust it because there's no evidence that Pontius Pilate ever existed. And they just continue to find these things over and over and over. Enough evidence for us to believe. And then also our testimony, our changed lives. That should be a part of the evidence. I mean, that should be our own personal evidence that solidifies our faith in Jesus Christ and, and gives us the strength to know that we do believe in something that is solid and that, that is based upon some evidence, but also on faith because he has changed my life. That's probably the strongest evidence that I personally have is my changed life. Because before I came to Christ, I was a wicked person. I was pretty much only thinking of myself and enjoying myself. I didn't think of my wife, didn't think of my children. I just thought about myself and enjoying myself. 
I had no desire to seek God or love God. I did not like religion. I wanted nothing to do with religion. I was raised a Catholic. I only went to Catholic church if I was forced to on a wedding or some funeral, and that was probably it. Uh, I was raised a Catholic during my childhood and went religiously on Sunday mornings with my parents and so forth, but I was forced to do so. And, and so I was a, a sinful man. And then Christ comes into my heart and I don't even know what happened. I just know that I asked him into my heart. I asked him to be real to me. I asked him to change my life. And, and I'll tell you, overnight, the Holy Spirit changed my life. Overnight. Now, Virginia didn't believe me, but within a couple of months, she said, wow, you're not the same person. Within, within about a month or so, I gave up drinking. Just gave up drinking i was convicted i was at a, at a at a block party there in the community here that we got invited to and the guy offered me a beer so i grabbed the beer and i started drinking it and then i'm witnessing to him i'm literally witnessing to him with his beer in my hand and the lord goes what are you doing I'm like well, i'm witnessing to this guy yeah but you got a beer in your hand i'm like ah i didn't even realize i had the beer and it was just so natural and from that point i said lord just take this away from me Take this away from me. And so I put it down and never had one again. The Lord took it away from me. And he would do that periodically. It wasn't something that I was just seeking out. He just did it. And my life changed completely. I started reading. I hated reading. I hated studying. And I started reading the Bible. Within six months, I read through the whole Bible. And my life just continued to change and grow. And I was changing uh, towards my family, towards my wife, towards those that were outside of our family uh, probably one of the biggest changes that virginia saw was my relationship with her father we didn't have a good relationship it was really broken and i hated the man he put me in a situation where i had to literally uh, work or find work or, or really stress out and on finding a place to 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 support my family um to live, to pay bills, to feed them and so forth. And, and it seemed like he just didn't care when he had the strength and the power in his own hands to, to give me what I needed to take care of my family at the time we were living with him. And so because of all of this, uh, we were able to move out. And I told Virginia, that's it. We're, we're never going back there again, never. And we didn't. Years would pass and never go down there. She could call once in a while, talk to her mom, whatever, but we just never went down there. And then I get saved, and the Lord forgave me, and he forgave a lot. And I remember that day when, and it was towards the holidays, where the Lord started bringing to mind, you know, her family, her mother, her brothers, her sisters, her dad, and so forth, and how we don't go over there. And the Lord just said, wait a minute, I have forgiven you. Why can't you forgive others? And I thought, wow, I need to forgive this guy. And I think that was the biggest change in my life. And so I, I, I went to my wife and I says, we need to go to your family for Christmas. And she's like, oh, okay. That just blew her away. And so we went down there. Never said anything, never brought up any subject. We just introduced ourselves once again into the family and began to be a, a light and salt and allowed God to do his work. What do they read when they see you? when you're out there, when you're frustrated? What do they read? As we come to chapter 22, we see an indictment against the leadership of Judah here because they had grown corrupt. The political system had become very immoral. And so God was going to judge them because of their lack of witness. They were no longer a witness to the other nation. They were like the other nations. Uh, you can kind of relate uh, to this today because we've become like that here in America. We used to be a Christian nation. We used to pride ourselves in being a Christian nation. Our presidents would, would talk about being Christians and so forth, and we just don't have that anymore. It seems like we have fallen away from that witness. And so this chapter is very close to us here in this nation of ours. Some think that this chapter in itself is a collection of messages that Jeremiah gave to the political leaders of the time. And he's kind of put them together and lumped them here in chapter 22. Now, we're going to talk about the politics of that time, the leaders and the kings who were to be those examples uh, to the nations around them and also to those subjects that were under them. And we know politics. 
politics can be very corrupt, right? I mean, we have a good number amount of politicians that love the Lord. Uh, I know several of them. Uh, I know that uh, Huckabee will be probably running for president here. He he stepped down from his, his show there on Fox News. And so I know that he'll probably be running here real soon. Uh, we went uh, back in, uh, oh, I don't know, July or August to a um, nation awareness uh <clears throat> conference where he was the guest speaker uh, we probably were sitting in a room of about 150 pastors senior pastors of of southern california and, and he pretty much shared his heart i never knew that he was a pastor and he pastored a small church and he has his great passion and love for god and for seeing people come to know jesus christ that was news to me and it, it was really neat to see his heart so i know there are politicians out there that love the Lord and that want to serve the Lord in that capacity. But I also know there are corrupt politicians. And I think we all know it and they know it and they know we know it, but they just continue to go on as though we don't know it. You know, and that's what's so crazy about it all, right? I mean, they know we know it and we know we know it, but they just go on and keep doing what they do. And we just smile and say, oh, but we know what you're doing. But we can't do anything about it, can we? (laughs) We try to do things about it, but we just can't. Just like that man in Arizona, that's crazy. Here in the United States, because he has a home Bible study on his property, which is illegal apparently, and so he's going to jail for it and going to be fined, him and his family. Uh, That's how corrupt politics is. Is that a separation of church and state? No, it's not. It's an invasion on our privacy and so forth. But, But politics has always been like that throughout the centuries it's always been corrupt there's always been corrupt men anytime you get men involved there's going to be corruption i think that's why god told israel that i don't want a king over you i want to be your king i want to lead you i want to guide you but they kept insisting no we want a king like the other nations he says well if i give you a king you know what's going to happen they're going to be men like the other nations they're going to take your children they're going to take your women they're going to take your material things and they're going to support their little kingdom and that's exactly what happened so anytime you get men involved, there's always going to be corruption. Gaius Julius Caesar came from an old noble Roman family. Julius is his family name. Caesar identifies uh, the branch of the ancient family he belonged to. And we know the story of, of Gaius Caesar. His family had been involved in politics there in the Republic of Rome. However, in his 30s, Caesar began to climb Rome's political ladder. He presented himself as a populace. He promised uh, the citizens of Rome to give them a better life. Hear that before? I'm going to give you a better life. We're going to all give you health care. We're going to make sure everybody has health care. Whatever the cost is for everyone else, they're going to pay it for you. you know? We're going to give you all phones. We're going to make sure you're taken care of because we love you guys you know, and so forth. Uh, we've heard that just like with Julius Caesar, who promised them a better life. And the people elected him to various uh, magistrates. He also served as a governor in Spain. In in 60 BC, before Christ, Caesar and two other men, Pompey and Marcus, they became very close friends. One was wealthy uh, and the other had political connections and together they began to institute the Roman government. Each member brought different qualities Uh, to their um, relationships well after a while they began to get angry at one another and fight they had sided with uh, the enemy of Caesar here and hopes to kill him and take his authority and power away from him and of course he got wind of that and was fighting Marcus there for quite a few years and his sons until he finally was able to get rid of them and finally once he was in control they asked him to leave his army come into rome and to face his accusers well he said there's no way i'm going to do that because i know as soon as i come into rome you're going to arrest me and you'll imprison me so he didn't do that he ended up taking his army and he ended up going into rome well after that the people loved him so much that they decided that he was going to make him emperor forever and say so they ruled that he would be in power from that point on as caesar and it wasn't until february of 44 bc that the um people of rome voted caesar in that office 
of dictator for life. But then there was a group of senators and noblemen of Rome who conspired against Caesar and then they assassinated him on the 15th of March, 44 BC. Politics, <laughs> you know, that's politics. It, it, it was happening then and it, it was happening, it's happening today. And it's gonna continue to happen because when you get men involved, there's always corruption around. And so you have kings here who are corrupt and God is bringing a message of judgment towards them. Look at verse one as Jeremiah's message to the royal house of Judah. Thus says the Lord, go down to the house of the king of Judah and they and there speak this word. Now, we know back in chapter 21, Zedekiah came or sent a messenger to Jeremiah to ask him to pray for them because they knew that something was coming. Uh, judgment was coming. And so they pleaded with Jeremiah to please call upon God. Here, God now says, you go down to them and you pronounce this judgment to them. The verb suggests that uh, Jeremiah was probably uh, at the temple because in a higher elevation looking down there at the kings. And he says, verse two, hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, you who sit on the throne of David, you and your servants and your people who enter these gates. So this message is not just to the king, who is the leadership of that time, but also to his servants and to the people who entered the palace gates continually. Thus says the Lord, execute judgment and righteousness and deliver the plunder out of the hands of the oppressor. That sounds pretty clear, right? Look, you're a king. It's your responsibility to execute judgment and righteousness. Be a good king. Do what's right. Follow the law. Keep the law. Don't take bribes. Make sure that you're fair with everybody. It's pretty simple. But how hard it is to do the simple things, isn't it? so hard to do the simple things. God tells us, just love one another. But boy, do we struggle with that, don't we? I struggle with that. You know, how do we love one another? Thank God that he forgives us. Thank God the blood of Jesus Christ is there for us. Otherwise, none of us would stand. It's simple, but yet it's so hard. He says, do no wrong and do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place. You know, because of his position and influence. The king was supposed to be that example to the people and is observant to the law. That's a good leader, one who follows the law, one who maintains the law, who is an example to the people so that when they look up to him, they say, there's a righteous man. There's a man who follows the law. He makes the laws, but he also follows the law. And it was expected of him to protect them those that were defenseless, those that were weak. He was to put, uh, protect them from any harm or from the enemy and so forth. He also was to warn them not to uh, shed innocent blood. And when you look at the kingdom of God, though, today, the kingdom of God, now we're in a kingdom of God. You understand that, right? As believers, we belong to the kingdom of God. There are two kingdoms. There's the worldly kingdom, that's the world out there. And then there's the godly kingdom. Well, we belong to a spiritual kingdom. And we're all a part of that kingdom. And so within that kingdom, you have the groups of Christians throughout the world, the different parts of the body of Christ. And, and within that kingdom, you have leadership throughout that kingdom. And so you have leadership like John MacArthur, uh, like Brian Broderson. You know, you have leadership like Chuck Swindoll and, and those Alistair Beck, you know, and, and, and so forth. These are all leaders that, that seem to be up there. Um, could you put the Pope in there? Probably not, but some might say, yeah, you could probably put the Pope in there. He's a spiritual leader to a certain extent, but I don't know if he necessarily would be a part of the kingdom or not. Uh, if he knows the Lord Jesus Christ, then yeah, he'd, he'd be a part of that kingdom. Well, we're all a part of that kingdom. So as we are a part of the kingdom, we have leadership. And the Bible's clear. You read Timothy, you read Titus, and there's leadership. When Jesus left, he told the disciples that they would be apostles, they would be leaders, they would be messengers, and they'd go out. And then they would establish churches, and then the churches would have leadership within those churches. And so God established this type of leadership. Well, the leadership of the churches within the kingdom of God are to be those examples today. We are to be examples to those in the church and outside the church. We are to protect the widows, the fatherless. We're to feed the homeless. 
We're to take care of those that don't have as much. We're to lead and to guide by example. Now, we don't always do that, and we fail from time to time. As I mentioned uh, earlier, that there are leadership that put this picture of being righteous, but in reality, they're not. And you'll have that from time to time. And we, within the kingdom of God, need to understand that, that we're all men and we all fall short. You can look at some of the Old Testament saints like David, who was a righteous man, loved the Lord, a, God, a man after God's own heart, and yet he fell. He fell. And yet the people supported him and helped him. You know, I, I think of the Calvary Chapel pastor who fell, and yet it was amazing how much support was there for him from the body of Christ because they loved him. They, they loved his teaching. Uh, they loved what he brought to them. And this is an area that he struggled with and hopefully he's getting help. Will he come back? I don't know. Uh, time will only tell that. I've seen it before with other people, other well-known pastors, uh, men that are great teachers. You know, there, there's a guy who fell probably back in the 90s. And I know Pastor Chuck had a lot of grace towards this man because he was a great teacher. And Chuck just couldn't see losing him. That's how good he was. And so Chuck invested a lot of time uh, into him. And eventually he was restored. And today he goes and, and he teaches a lot of Calvary's. Great teacher. Knows the Greek. Knows the intenses and so forth. Just awesome teacher. But need to be warned because I've seen him from time to time. And boy, the guy likes to flirt with girls. I just see it. You know, and I'm like, wow, he, he, he hasn't fully learned yet hasn't fully learned yet and that that's that's a place where you don't want to go you have to be careful as leadership because people are watching you i was watching him i know where he came from and i'm i'm seeing him and he's and he's pulling these girls and going up and hugging them and then he sits them on his lap and so forth and i'm going no 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 don't do that what are you doing stop it <laughs> you know don't you know people are watching you see that's scary that's scary when those things happen but they happen because we're men because we're sinners and we fall short of the glory of God. And so not that we need to expect it, but when it happens, don't be surprised because we're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. But we are to strive to be good leaders, to be examples. Uh, and not just pastors, not just elders and deacons, but fathers and mothers to their children and grandparents and so forth are to be good leaders to your children. We're all in a sense leaders and, and we need to be a reflection of Christ and who he is. So apostles, just like the 12, and pastors and deacons. So the leaders in the kingdom of God have to lead by example, every way if possible. Then ultimately, our example of the body of Christ is really the head, and that's Jesus Christ. He is the perfect example. And when we look to him, he'll never fail us. He will be righteous and perfect in every way. And so we need to look at, to his example. Verse 4. For if you indeed do this thing, then shall enter the gates of this house, riding on horses and in chariots, accompanied by servants and people, kings who sit on the throne of David. Okay, so if you do this, look, you'll enter in and out on horses and chariots. I will bless you if you do these things. But if you will not hear these words, I swear by myself... Uh, again, he's, he, he's really, really impressing upon the leadership here uh, uh, with a threat that, look, I swear by my own name, and there is no other name higher than mine, says the Lord, that this house shall become desolate. Well, we know through history that this house became desolate because they wouldn't listen or heed. For thus says the Lord to the house of the king of Judah, you are Gilead to me, the head of Lebanon, yet I surely will make you a wilderness cities which are not inhabited i will prepare destroyers against you everyone with his weapons they shall cut down your choice cedars and cast them into the fire gilead and, and, and lebanon were noted for their forests they had great cedars uh, trees that you can just see for miles and miles and miles uh, of cedar and, and cedar was well known and, and well liked at that time um, David had cedar in his palace. Solomon had cedar in their palace. And you know how cedar smells. It smells really beautiful, you know. It, it really gets rid of all the other smell, and you, all you do is smell cedar. If you have a cedar closet or cedar laid inside your drawers and so forth. So 
So God uses his example of their abundance and their wealth and say, look, I will chop you down like your men chop down the cedar trees. I'm going to make you desolate completely. And many nations will pass by this city and everyone will say to his neighbor, why has the Lord done so to this great city? That's always the question, isn't it? When things happen to people, when things happen to nation, why did that happen? Was, was God involved in this? Is God saying something to us? You know the Jews believe that, that the Old Testament, the Torah, that God wrote everything for a purpose. They really believe every word, every name, every dot, every comma, every period was there for a purpose. There's a reason. God wouldn't put it down on paper if there wasn't a reason for it. So if you find a name, there's a reason for that person's name being there. And you just have to search it out. And so that's why they're so diligent in locating that name and where it's listed in all the different areas and what does it mean, and what's the intent, and trying to bring it together and, and really see what is God saying to us about that one name because God doesn't say something without it having meaning behind it. You know, and we need to take the scriptures that way. When we see nations like this uh, here in Judah, when we see nations like Iraq, when we see China, when we see Russia who's, who's going through some financial difficulties right now, when we see stuff like that happen, we have to ask ourselves, what is God doing? What is God doing? I mean, we can say that. Uh, I've heard pastors say this, and I, uh, and I can understand it to a certain degree because we don't want to make God out to be like this, this mean guy who sits up there and every time a disaster happens, oh, that's God, you know, bringing judgment on you. you know, it could be, but it couldn't be. We, we don't know because nothing's written down and he hasn't told us that that's me. You know, but when you look at it and, and you start examining things and what's going on and, and so forth, you, you have to ask yourself, was God involved in that? I don't know. Does God get involved in things like that? I think he does. I think he's, he, he's saying something to us. There, there, there's an underlying message maybe. When you look at the world today, I think the enemy says something to us. When, when you see common threads in certain things, you go, wow, someone's like weaving this thread through all this, though there's, there's different groups and organizations in different areas, but there's a common thread in it all. And so you know, boy, that's Satan. That's Lucifer. And he's using all these groups. You know, when you see human trafficking you know, taking place from San Diego and Mexico and, and, and young women disappearing and children disappearing, where are they going? And why can't they find them? And, and then pornography. Um, I just heard a statistic that it's like a, a multi-billion dollar industry. You know, I heard Walmart, and don't quote me on this one but because I might be wrong, but Walmart is like the number one store chain in the world, number one. It outproduces in money than Costco and, and, and all the grocery stores put together, put together, Walmart outproduces them all. And yet, the pornography industry does more than, than Walmart. That's amazing. That's a big industry. And then you see this human trafficking. You see pornography. You see abduction. You, know, you, you see what's going on in the world, and you go, there's a thread through all this. You know, when you read scriptures and, and you see what the enemy has done to kill children during the time of Herod, during the time of Egypt, and so forth, and you go, there's a thread. Is the enemy involved in this? Yeah, you better believe he is. It's evil. It's, it's wicked. And he's involved. And we need to be aware of that. Is God involved in these things? Yeah, I think he is involved. That his plan is unfolding. You know, the Bible says that he wished that none should perish, but that all come to repentance. So guess what? He's giving every man and woman an opportunity to give their lives to Christ. He, he's allowing things to happen in your life, putting you in certain places, experience certain things so that you will humble yourselves and say, I need you, God, because I can't do this on my own. I can justify what I'm doing. I can rationalize it. I can try to figure it out. I can go to doctors. I can see psychologists. I can do all these things. I can love money. I can keep myself busy. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you're going, 
why am I here? <laughs> what is going on? Well, God's saying, you just need me. You need to give your heart to me. You need to give your life to me. You need to just trust in me. You need to believe my word, and you need to apply my word. You know, just getting back to basic. Just saying, Lord, come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my God. Let me start there. Inviting you into my heart again, Lord. Just afresh and anew today. But I've already done that. that that's good. I, I do it periodically and just, just to refresh myself. Lord, I'm inviting you once again into my heart. I know I don't always have you there. I know I get busy. I know there's sin in my life at times. You know, anger all of a sudden flares up, Lord. So I invite you into my heart again, Lord. Let's start fresh. Let's start there, Lord. Now let me just love you, Lord, today. Let me love you. Let me love my neighbor. Let me start there in the basics and ask you to do a work in my life. Sometimes we need to just do that and then fall in love with God again and believe what his word says. Believe what his word says. Verse 80 goes on, and many nations will pass by this city and everyone will say to his neighbor, why has the Lord done so to this great city? Then they will answer because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God and worship other gods and serve them. Very clear. That's why. Because they've sinned against God. They have forgotten God. They are backsliding. They are backsliding. You know, you don't just backslide one day. You wake up in the morning and just say, hey, what happened? I'm totally backslidden from the Lord. It doesn't happen like that. It doesn't happen like that at all. You, know, you could be serving the Lord and involved and, and, and enjoying it, and, and all of a sudden, just slowly, something just happens. You know, well, I'm just going to kind of step back a little bit, and I want to be refreshed. I just, just want to sit a little bit and just hear on the Lord. And so you decide, let me just hear on the Lord. And so you sit, and you just hear on the Lord, and you're not doing as much as you were doing. And you're sitting, and you're waiting, and you're just wondering where he's at, and Next thing you know, it's like, well, let me just sit at home, you know? I don't have to go on a Wednesday night. I don't have to go to the men's breakfast. I don't have to go to the women's study. I'll just, let me just relax here and let me just seek God. And you're not really seeking God because you don't have time. You know, things happen, work, babies, kids, you know, parents going here and there. Next thing you know, it's like, I haven't sought God yet. I need to seek God. Okay, let me, let me just step back from Wednesdays and I'll take Wednesday nights and I'll just seek the Lord. And next thing you know, is Wednesday nights are, are all taken up now with the kids and other things. Or maybe they're asking you to work even later, you know. Now you're only on Sundays. And then you say, well, you know, I work hard all week long and, and Saturdays I, I got to run around and I just need to get things done and take care of the car and the bills and whatever honeydew list that I need to do. And, you know, Sunday comes and, and you know what, I'll do Sunday nights. Let me just do Sunday nights. You know, just go Sunday night service and then I'm ready for the week because Sunday mornings you got to rest. And then you get to Sunday nights and you're going, you know, I got to go to work on Monday morning. So maybe I'll skip Sunday night because, you know, I got to get to bed early and so forth. Next thing you know is you're backslidden. It, it doesn't just happen overnight. It's a slow process. That's why you need to keep your priorities, your priorities. I've always told my wife and my children, be involved in church. I've taught them from when they were little. You go to church on Sunday, you go to church on Wednesday, and when there's events, you go to church. That's always been our philosophy, and we've, we've rarely missed Sundays and Wednesdays and whenever there's events. We are always in church because we're in the kingdom of God. We understand that. We're a part of the kingdom of God. We're not a part of the world anymore. And so we want to be involved in what God is doing within his community, within his church, because we're a part of that kingdom in the body of Christ. And that will keep us from backsliding. Now we come to the message to Josiah, verse 10. Weep not for the dead, nor bemourn him. Weep bitterly for him who goes away, for he shall return no more, nor see his native country. Now, in other words, God was basically saying for Josiah, don't even weep for him. He's dead, he's dead, don't worry about him. It reminds me of the scripture that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 8, verse 22. He's, he asked the disciples to follow him, and some of them were saying, well, we've got to uh, uh, go and bury our father first before we can come and follow you. And what they were saying was, look, our father's not dead yet. 
but we need, to, we need to wait till he's dead. And then when he's dead, we're going to bury him. And then we'll come follow you. That's what they were saying. And Jesus said to them, look, let the dead bury the dead. You don't worry about that. Because once they're dead, they're dead. They can't do anything. And you can't do anything for them. So get busy now while you're still here, is what he was saying. And, there, and Jesus, or Jeremiah, is saying to them through God that you need to just let this guy go. He's dead. Don't mourn him anymore. For thus says the Lord concerning Shalom, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, who reigned instead of Josiah, his father, who went from this place. He shall not return here any more, but he shall die in the, in the place where they had laid him captive and shall see the land no more shulam was also known by the name of jehoshaphat he was the fourth son of josiah and he became a a ruling king there at that time and then we have another message concerning jeconiah it says woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness now this king was unrighteous and he built the kingdom of god in unrighteousness and his chambers by injustice whose use who uses his neighbor's service without wages and gives him nothing for his work, who says, I will build myself a wide house with spacious chambers and cut out windows for it, panels with its cedar and painting it with vernalum. Now this was Je- Jehoiakim who had heavily taxed the people and were abusing them heavily and God was bringing a woe upon him. He says, shall you reign because you enclose yourself in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it will, it was well with him. He judged and cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well, was not this knowing me, says the Lord? Yet your eyes and your heart are for nothing but your covetousness, for shedding innocent blood and practicing oppression and violence. That's not the kind of leadership you want. That is selfishness. That's basically what he was. If it wasn't about me, then I don't want to hear it. If it wasn't building my kingdom, then get out of here. There's more to life than me, than I. The middle letter in the word sin is I. You know, it can't be about I and me. It has to be about others. When we start making it about I, you're headed for trouble. I'm telling you right now, if you got the attitude of me and what I think and what I want, you're headed for trouble. It's not about that. It's about what does God want and how can I better God's people? How can I lift them up? How can I encourage them? How can I strengthen them? How can I motivate them to go on? It's all about thinking of others more highly than I think of myself. That's scriptural. Anything other than that is sin. And that's what this king was doing. He was all about I. Therefore, verse 18, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, at last my brother, or at last my sister, they shall not lament for him, saying, At last master, or at last glory, he shall be buried with the burial of a donkey, dragged and cast out beyond the gates of Jerusalem. In other words, they're going to take his body and they're just going to cast it out there with everything else that's rubbish. When I was growing up in Roland Heights, before the Puente Hills Mall was there, before the fun zone and all those car dealerships and all that industry there, it was just land, vacant land uh, with weeds and trees. There was a little, little stream that used to run through there. There was a huge tree by the stream. We called it Big Tree. Somebody tied a rope there, and we used to swing on it and jump into the little stream of water there. That's where we grew up when we were kids. And we would find cars. You know, people would just take their cars there and dump them, and they just kind of lay there in the, in the middle of the, the, the plot there and just pile up their cars. It was a junkyard in a sense, at time to time. You'd find bikes, you'd find parts, just junk, you know. And that's what he was saying here. Your body is going to be thrown away with the donkeys and the horses and, and all the junk that, that's dead and we just kind of throw it in one place and we forget about it. So you will be thrown there too. Now the fate of Jerusalem. Go up to Lebanon, verse 20. Cry out and lift up your voice to Bashan. Cry from Abram, for all your lovers are destroyed. So in other words, their allies 
will be destroyed at this point. I spoke to you in your prosperity, but you said, I will not hear. That's a, a, a spiritual deafness. Not hearing. My mom used to say in Spanish, are you deaf? You know, she'd, she'd tell me to do something. I'm like, huh? She goes, are you deaf? Are you deaf? Uh, you hear. Uh, why, watch people. Uh, when I was at a therapy, a physical therapy here in Rancho, uh, the guy that, that owned the whole business, he was a Christian, and he would, uh, he would correct his employees all the time. He, he, he felt like he was a teacher. And so he would correct his, their, his employees to respond correctly, respectfully, and to get rid of bad habits. And so he would say something like, did you apply the, uh, the lotion to the injury? And the employee would usually say, what'd you say? And he'd look at them, wouldn't say a thing. And then they would answer him, oh yeah, I did that. He goes, why did you ask me what I said when you heard what I said? You ever notice that about people? You ask them something, then they go, what'd you say? They, they know what you said, but what are they saying? What are they really saying? And that's a habit that we get into. Well, I heard you. Okay, so what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? You know, we need to be hearers, but we also need to be doers. James is very clear on that, right? If, if you have faith... And Paul says, if you have faith, then show me your works. Well, you know, I believe in Jesus. I go to church. Are those works? I think James is talking more about using the gifts that God has given to you, the talents that he's entrusted you with, the resources that he's entrusted you with. All of those things are works. You know. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. So, someone posted that on Facebook. And I love that scripture. For by grace... There's justification, right? By grace alone, that's it. But it's through faith. That's a work, faith. That's sanctification. But it's not by works. At least any man should boast. And yet the next verse, and they were using that scripture to, to show that, that we're saved by grace and God's love and there's nothing that we need to do. But then the next verse in verse 10, they always leave this one off. But, but he has created works for us that we should walk in them. What's that about then? <laughs> you mean uh, you mean I I'm not saved if I don't do works? Yeah, well that's what it sounds like it's saying. You're you're saved by grace, but it's through faith, and it's not of works, but you have works. And James said the same thing. If you say you have faith, show me your works. And if you don't have works, then you don't have faith in God. Because as believers in the kingdom of God, there's a lot of work to be done. We can't just be sitting in the pews getting spiritually fat, doing nothing. We have to be busy about God's kingdom. And that could be from witnessing to sharing our faith to passing out flyers. You know, I, I know people who, who take our, our tracks and they just keep them in their purses or in their pockets and wherever they go, they just put them on the, on the chairs or on the tables or where they're eating and they just throw one there. And that's a ministry to them. That's a work. Something that we should think about doing. He goes on and says, this has been your manner from your youth that you did not obey my voice. How sad, from your youth. Now it starts at that point, right? Youth, not childhood, but youth. Because when, when, when does rebellion really start? Well, rebellion is, rebelliousness is always in, in the heart of a child, but you don't see the evidence of it until they become youths. <laughs> Seems at that age of 14 and 15, all of a sudden that rebelliousness just comes out. And that's when they start uh, being, being visually rebellious. Don't tell me what to do. You know, and you're like, what? I'm your parent. Don't talk to me that way. Well, you can't tell me what to do. You know, I've read Google and it says I have rights. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, I've heard of this girl suing their parents and I can sue you. I'll just call the soul. I had a, a friend of mine who loved his daughter and so forth, but she was just wild and she ended up calling social services on him. And unfortunately, they don't realize this social service takes them away. <laughs> so they took her away from him. And they were on probation for a while until they could figure it all out. And then finally she confessed, yeah, he didn't do any of it. I was just really mad at him. See, they, they know they have power. They have, you know, some sort of authority because of what the government's doing and what they're giving them. And that's sad, that rebelliousness from their youth. You know, and if the youth doesn't understand that that's not right, 
You shouldn't act like that. That's not responsible. You don't do that to your parents. The Bible's very clear. You honor your parents. If you want to live a long life, you better honor your parents. You better be obedient to your parents and you'll live long. But if not, your life might be cut short. And so from their youth, they did not obey. The wind shall eat up all your rulers and your lovers shall go into captivity. Surely then you will be ashamed and humiliated for all your wickedness. O inhabitants of Lebanon, making your nests in the cedars, how glorious will you be when pangs come upon you like the pain of a woman in labor. As I live, says the Lord, though Coniah, the son of Jekyllkim, king of Judah, were the signet on my right hand, yet I would pluck you off, and I will give you into the hand of those who seek your life, and into the hand of those whose face you fear, the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and the hand of the Chaldeans. So I will cast you out and your mother who bore you into another country where you were not born, and there you shall die. Now, Jehoiakim, or Coniah, which God uses as another name, removing the J, which stands for God, um, signifying that I am no longer a part of your life and I'm going to curse you. And in fact, I'm going to curse your ancestry line uh, from this point on. Look at what he says about him. But to the land to which they desire to return, there they shall not return. Is this man, Coniah, a despised, broken, broken idol, a vessel in which is no pleasure? Why are they cast out? He has he and his descendants and cast into a land which they do not know. O earth, O earth, earth, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Now let's stop and look at that just for a second here. Was he childless? No, he had seven sons. He had seven sons that could have ruled. What God is saying is, that's it. You're cursed. I'm judging you. You will not sit upon the throne, nor your sons will sit upon the throne. It stops right here at this point. Well, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus come from the line of David? He's in the line of David. What's going on here? Does that mean Jesus isn't from the line of David? Well, when you read Matthew chapter 1, we find out that Joseph comes from the line of David. But he comes to this point and it stops. Because from that point on, no king ever sat upon the throne again. It's cursed. So it's broken right there. Well, wait a minute then. So where, where does Jesus get connected to David? Through Mary. You go to Luke and you look at that genealogy and it goes through uh, Solomon's brother, Nehemiah, to King David. And so God covers it right there. He took care of this person. He judged them. He cut the line at that point, but he also provided another line through, through Mary. It's genealogy there, which is pretty interesting. There's no, other, there's no other name like the name of Jesus. Pretty amazing when you, when you think about all of those intricate parts that God had to work out just to get Jesus to be at that point in time where he becomes the Messiah on earth. Let me close. It seems that all kings prior to Zedekiah had been warned of the coming punishment that God would pronounce upon them because of their idolatry. And this message may have been collected by several other incidences that Jeremiah was warning them concerning the events that would take place as a collection of truth. Now, we need to, as believers, take the scriptures as a collection of truths. And there are many warnings in the scriptures concerning the last days. And we need to be aware of those things and know that as we are living in this time and age and looking at what's going on in the world today, that God is going to bring judgment upon this world soon. And we need to be ready. We need to look up because our redemption is drawing near. And yet we need to live as though it's not coming soon so that we can save as many souls as possible.